Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much. You can be seated. Now, we want to move on to section four of the manual. Section four, page 39. Now, we're going to move through these kind of quick because I didn't really come here just to read a manual to you. The idea is that you get a hold of this and then you go back home and you search through this and you read the scriptures and you, nobody really gets all of it here at one time. This is something that you need to kind of constantly wash yourself with, with the washing of the water of the word. It's just very simple. And so there is a repetition to it that gets it built into you. Now you'll, you'll, you'll understand it, you'll, you'll hear it, you'll run with it. Uh, but, and as I was saying before, one of the things we noticed is that when people... Maybe they're getting some results uh, in, in the area of healing and they're doing a certain thing and then they think they're going to take the DHT and add it into what they're doing and they'll get better results. Usually what happens, it's the opposite. Usually their results drop. Why? Because they're trying to mix things and they contradict themselves. Now usually, I've been around a lot of different teachings, um, pretty much all of them, to be honest with you. Uh, my library at home has over 5,000 books in it. I have every book I've ever seen on healing, I've both for and against. And so I've gone through this. Now, my whole library is not all healing books. There's other topics also. But, and I've been collecting them for, you know, 40 years now. And so the reason I'm saying that is that there is a, um, <clears throat> when you start to blend things, when you start to mix things, yeah. and there's a contradiction, then you're trying to kind of, get both of them working and you're not sure about either one. And because of that, faith is sure. Faith is no hesitation. Faith is just, it's, it's a confidence in knowing that what you're saying is true and you can prove it from the word of God. And so when you start mixing messages, you're going to contradict yourself. So the key is find the truth, stick with the truth, speak the truth, and don't back off. <clears throat> so we see that a lot. Now, section four, <clears throat> why did Jesus heal? It says here, if you start with the wrong perception, then every thought can be wrong. So as we said yesterday, a half-truth is a total error, right? The devil loves half-truths. Jesus did not heal to prove he was God. Now, that's the thing we hear all the time. Well, Jesus just healed. He did that to prove he was God. Well, if Jesus healed to prove he was God, then the 12 were God too, because the 12 healed the sick. The 70 were also God, because they healed the sick, Right? So Jesus could not heal to prove he was God. As a matter of fact, if he was healing to prove he was God, then he did a really bad marketing plan because he said, now you're free, don't go tell anybody, yeah. right? So if he was doing it to prove he was God, he would have said, yep, tell everybody, yeah. tell everybody, right? But he didn't do that. So we have to look at this. This is one of those sacred cows that have been built up over time. Now, as we say, what, what did Jesus come to do? Well, 1 John 3, 8. It says, he that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. <clears throat> now, so let's look at the real Jesus and how he did things, all right? In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, it's amazing to me how many times it says he healed every sickness and every disease and he healed them all, right, over and over again, and yet people still have a question about whether it's God's will to heal everybody. Right. Jesus was God's will in action and in manifestation, right? Now, what that means is in Hebrews 1.1 uh, 1, and 1.2 even tells us that Jesus was the express image of God and that means the fullness, and that means that Jesus actually showed us every aspect of God's true nature. Why? Because God's true nature is the nature of love, yes. right? And so if Jesus didn't show it to us, it's not a part of who God wants to be. Do you get that? Now, if you remember, <clears throat> when Jesus started preaching in Luke chapter 4, it says there was given him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah, and he found the place where it was written. So he had to open it up and find the place. And he started reading from what we know as Isaiah chapter 61. He started reading, reading verse 1. And he read through it. And as he read through it, he said, this is why he has sent me, right? But then you'll notice it says he sent him to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it goes right into, and the day of the vengeance of our God. But he didn't quote that part. 
he only quoted the part of him preaching the day, uh, the uh, year of acceptance. Why? Why did he stop before he said the day of vengeance? Because at his first coming, it was he was his first coming was to show us our acceptance by God. It was not to show the vengeance of God, right? That's pretty much saved for the second one, right? You got that? So he was quoting why he was here. Now, <clears throat> so he came, and and over again here you can see here even uh, that he healed all the sick. He did three things: teach, preach, and heal. That's what he did. Now, here's the thing. Remember this. It does not say four things. It says he taught, he preached, and he healed. But we also know he delivered people from demons. Isn't that right? But now notice healing or being delivered from demons falls under the category of healing. So many times people try to divide the two, and I understand you can be specific on it, but people divide a lot of times and say, and they will ask the question, when do I know to cast out a devil and when do I know to heal the sick? Right? It doesn't matter. Do you understand? See, we get so specific sometimes. Okay, I, I'll, well, yeah, we need to bring this up at this point, I guess. The reason most people want to be that specific is twofold. Number one, they want to be an expert. And they want to be viewed as an expert. And experts have to have more intimate detailed knowledge than non-experts. So you get in, you learn a bunch of details about stuff. Now the constant hunger of Christians to, for more knowledge or more information, let's put it that way, leads them to the point where they end up knowing more than they walk in. And when you know more than you walk in, technically you're backslid. You get that, right? So the key is to walk in what you know. Now, the problem is whenever you know more than you're walking out, you have all the details, but then because, and especially you have to remember, Jesus was in ministry approximately three and a half to four years at the most. Some people say three, but there's four uh, Passovers mentioned, so we know it was approximately about four, actually. So when you have Jesus, his entire ministry was three to four years, and most Christians honestly have been Christian longer than some Christians have been longer, have been Christians longer than Jesus lived the, the whole 33 years, right? And the problem is we gather every Sunday and we expect something new every Sunday. In reality, there should be a constant drilling so that we don't let the things slip. Remember I read that yesterday. We don't let these things slip that we have heard. Repetition is the mother of memory. And so you have to always remember, never be upset if you hear the same thing twice or three times. Get it drilled into you. Yes. Amen? Know it better. Know every part of it. But the key is a lot of times people will, because they're in a group or they're coming to hear preaching or they're part of the preaching, many times we had this idea that we, had a, we have to have something new for them every Sunday You know, if we want them to keep coming. Honestly, that shouldn't be our concern. Our concern should be, are they learning to walk in what they're hearing, right? And people say, well, when are we going to hear something new? Uh, whenever you do the last thing I told you, Amen. right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> then you'll hear something new, right? And so you start doing it, we'll move on. But the problem a lot of times is we want to have these details, and it's looking for the details <clears throat> that actually cause us to go off into error sometimes. And that's where this idea of spiritual roots of diseases, that's where they came from. That, that, is, that did not come out of the Bible, okay? It came from a psychologist who saw people that he wasn't able to help them get healed, and so he brought his psychology into it and started analyzing it and then dressed it up with Christian terminology. That's where it came from. Okay, now, I could go through a list, and I'm not here really just bash these things, but, okay, <laughs> but... For instance, uh, theophostics. Theophostics is definitely a psychological, psychiatric type of ministry, if you want to call it ministry. It is not biblical, right? Are there some bits and pieces that are true? Yeah, why? Because if, if people get helped at all, it's going to have something to do with God because he's trying to help people, right? And you can take a little bit of truth, which makes it a total lie if you don't have all truth. Does that make sense? This, this thing recently, too, with the idea of sozo, right? Again, that's another aspect that is psychological. Now, do some people get help? Yeah, in the sense that they feel, and listen carefully what I mean by help or what I'm saying about help. 
they feel an alleviation of problems that they're suffering at the time. But that's like somebody saying, um, well, this person had great pain. Uh, so, you know, I gave him some heroin. Okay, yeah, you might have taken away his pain, but you gave him a much longer term problem. That's what Sozo does. It takes away your initial pain, but it gives you a longer problem because it heads you off course. You understand? The same thing with spiritual roots. What, what's wrong with spiritual roots? Well, the idea of spiritual roots is that if there is, here's a basic thing. If you go back and read their, man, I have all their manuals. I've studied these things out because if it was true, I wanted it, right? But I have found where it disagrees with the Bible. And for instance, in um, the spiritual root uh, idea of teaching is that people say, okay, if you have, um, uh, there's all kinds of different things. If you have arthritis, it's because you're a bitter person. You have bitterness. Uh, if you have lower back pain, it's because of unforgiveness. I mean, it's just different things, right? And they trace this back to different things, and they try to pull it out of the Bible. But the reality is this. Here's the problem. <clears throat> it, there have been people that have been helped to a degree, right? Most of that is psychosomatic. It is not divine in nature, okay? People think they're going to get help. They're told now they've gotten help, and so they feel better. But usually the thing comes back, right? Now, <clears throat> here's the problem. If it's a spiritual root, what they tell you is this. Your physical problem is the result of an individual sin that you are committing or have committed. And now that sin is in you. And they always go back to if there is something in your spirit. See, the, it's, well, that's why they call it a spiritual root because the problem is in your spirit. Now, the minute you're born again, all of your spiritual problems are gone. Do you get that? You are recreated. And your spirit is recreated in the likeness and image of Christ. So there can be nothing in your spirit that is a problem. Do you get that? So your problems will either come out of your soul or out of your flesh, your, your body. Do you get that? Now, so when people say, well, the, the reason you have a physical problem is because of this sin. Now, is it possible to get a physical problem because of a sin? Yes, that is possible. But that sin, now understand what I mean by that is this. And I guess I would have to clarify terminology of what I mean by sin. For instance, <clears throat> if you smoke, you're more likely to develop lung cancer or lung problems than if you don't smoke. So the act of that thing ca can cause the problem. You get that? So that now, not an individual single act usually, but a continuous ongoing act could cause the problem. Now, let me probably need to back up a little bit here. There's three ways that people usually get sick. Okay, number one, the num probably the number one way is sowing and reaping. You do something long enough to your body, your body reacts to it, it pulls your body down, and you get sick. That's not even the devil. That's what you do to yourself. Okay, now I'm not saying the devil doesn't have anything to do with it. Maybe he's convincing you to do it. I don't know. <clears throat> it could be that. Number two, <clears throat> the second way is by an accident. In other words, now I'm, talking, I'm not talking about sickness or disease necessarily, but let's say you're driving down the road, you have an, a, an auto accident, and that does uh, damage to your body. <clears throat> and because of that, you're laid up in bed, and then you develop pneumonia because you're laying in bed too long, right? So now that pneumonia developed because of the accident, and people say, well, I don't believe in accidents. Okay, I'm, I'm not getting, you know, was the devil behind the person running the red light? Okay, I don't know. Maybe so. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm just saying generally it's classified as an accident, right? Nobody that we know of planned it. Therefore, it's an accident, okay? <clears throat> the third way is attack. The, the enemy just attacks you, right? I'm not going to say for no reason. He's got a reason. It's just not a good reason. His reason is he doesn't like you, right? But he can attack and at times, that's what he does. See, you know, if the, if the Christians were as good as their job as the devil is at his job, the, the world would be saved by now, right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> the idea <clears throat> is that there are three ways that people get sick, sowing and reaping, accidents, and attacks, right? Now, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> should drink more Coke during the break. <clears throat> <clears throat> People always get upset when I do that, when I say that. <clears throat> That's okay. Someday you'll have enough faith to drink any deadly thing and it won't hurt you. <clears throat> so, now, <laughs> so, <clears throat> now, 
It's amazing people because they, they know I don't eat vegetables. I've never eaten a vegetable. Don't have any plans of eating a vegetable. Please don't try to convince me to eat a vegetable. I don't want your salad. <clears throat> okay. And then people tell me I need to eat salad. And of course, it's the people that are in my healing line that are telling me that. So, well, when it works for you, then I'll wait and see. Okay. <laughs> no. <clears throat> no. But. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> yeah, if you have, I should have given you a, <clears throat> a warning. If you have children, put your finger in their ears so they don't hear all that. So, because <clears throat> I had people tell me, my, my child heard you say that. Now they're saying, I want to be like Brother Curry. I don't want to eat my vegetables either. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> when you're old enough to make that decision, you do that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that they're in the rabbit. That's right. So, the, the steak I ate ate the salad you're trying to give me. So I'm still getting it because you are what you eat. So there you go. So I'm still getting it. Now, <laughs> now I'm not going to get off on the nutrition stuff, but I mean, I, 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 I view nutrition like most people view God. I believe in it. I just don't do it well. I, I, don't, I don't obey it. Okay. That's the way most people do God. They believe in him. They just don't listen to him. It's kind of the same thing. So um, now, Get back into here where we're at before I get in trouble. <laughs> so, but now notice that these are the three basic ways that people get sick. <clears throat> now, you don't always have to determine which because it doesn't matter. And, and as we were talking during the break, the real key to this, what my real job here this week is simply this. I am here to convince you two things. Number one, God is, God's word is true. You can rely upon it. And number two, you are God's policeman. And your job is not to be his holiness policeman where you're judging people's holiness. You are God's policeman to stop and arrest evil. I say people are not the problem. The enemy is the problem. And he attacks people. Our job is to get him off of people. Right? It's just that simple. Now the problem with the <clears throat> spiritual root idea, like we said, is that people think because of a, they'll, they'll say, well, the problem is in, in your spirit. So you got to get this, because they see that as unforgiveness or something like that. But your problem is not in your spirit, right? Why? Because your spirit is complete in him, recreated in his likeness and image. Your spirit is perfect. <clears throat> the unforgiveness and all that stuff, that has to do with your soul, right. right? And so now you move into that area of the soul being the problem. Now, here's the real <clears throat> clincher or was for me about the spiritual root aspect. Everybody <clears throat> that participates in the spiritual root idea, okay? Matter of fact, they've got books that you can actually go through and find, okay, here's the problem, here's the disease, and here's the spiritual root, and here's the scripture you need to use to break that thing. Okay, the minute you do that, you have degenerated the Bible into a spell book, and you're using an incantation to try to bring about the power of God, right? First, that's the first problem. Second problem is this. The minute, <clears throat> what happens when you are well-trained in that school of thought? What happens is that when somebody walks up to you and they say, uh, well, you know, my, the doctors diagnosed me with arthritis. Immediately, your mind judges them as having bitterness. Now, you're accusing them of having bitterness, and you don't know, but you've been trained to link arthritis with bitterness. Right? Do you understand that? And so now what has happened is you have ceased being a deliverer and you have become a judge. Our job is not to judge, but to deliver, right? So it's not a matter of where it came from. And honestly, I mean, let's just be honest. If you have enough power to set any person free, you really don't care how they got that way, right? <clears throat> I remember back during World War II. Well, I don't remember, but I remember reading about it. <clears throat> okay, I'm not that old, okay? <clears throat> but... I've read that that's World War II and Civil War is probably my two favorite time periods to study as far as wars. And so in World War II, uh, whenever the Allied armies uh, liberated some of the Nazi concentration camps, if, if I'm really glad that the many, apparently, the Allied armies were not Christian in how they did it. Because whenever they came in, <clears throat> all of the prisoners would be lined up and now the Nazis are already gone, and so the Allies would be bringing them out, and they would bring them out. And now, understand, when they brought them out, they didn't say, you know, <clears throat> why are you in here? Uh, well, I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm, here, I'm in here because I'm Jewish. Oh, okay, well, yeah, we want to set you free. Now, this, this is what the Christians would do, right? 
Oh, you're Jewish? Okay, yeah, go free. Uh, why are you here for? Well, you know, I, I'm in here because I broke this law and I did this thing, and so they put me in here because of that. Oh, well, you really deserve to be here, so you stay. See, that's the mindset that Christians, they would pick and choose who deserves to be free, who doesn't deserve to be free, and they're starting to judge rather than just be a deliverer. In reality, it should be the same way the Allies did it, which is simply this. Oh, you are an enemy of the Third Reich? Okay, then you're my friend. Why? Because we both have the same common enemy. And if you're an enemy of my enemy, then we are friends. Yes. Right? We don't look at it of, well, you're not like me, so you're, I'm going to put you with my enemy. No, we set them free because we're called to be deliverers, not called to be judges. Amen? Yes. <clears throat> That's one of the amazing things about Jesus. Two, two things really stand out about Jesus. Number one, he, now get, get this, go, go study this out. Everything he was asked to do, he did. Yes. Yes. Not one time did he ever technically refuse. Now, the closest he came was with a Syrophoenician woman. Isn't that right? Because she was crying to him, and they said, Lord, send her away. She's doing all that stuff. And he said, no, look. He said, uh, it's not right to give the children's bread. What, what was she asking for? Deliverance for her daughter. So Jesus compared the children's bread to deliverance. So deliverance slash healing is the children's bread. Is that right? That's right? So according to what Jesus said. Now, he also said, give us this day our daily bread. So deliverance and healing is for us daily if we're God's child, especially. Isn't that right? Amen. So that should end that story right there. So he said, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. And the woman said, that's right, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus said, even though initially he told her no, now, okay, let's stop right there. Why did he tell her no? He said, I am not sent to the Gentiles, right? He said, but just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why? Because God had promised Abraham it would come to the Jews first through him because of his faithfulness to God. He had to give it to them first. It had to be rejected by them and then go to the Gentiles. Yes. Amen? So Jesus was just doing what God had sent him to do at that point. Now, Notice, though, even though he said, I am not sent to you, he turned around and said, woman, you have great faith. Because of that saying, he said, your daughter is, is delivered. Isn't that right? So now think about this. Now, I'm, I'm again, abstract, right? I look at the overall picture. So let's break this down and let's say at, at initially Jesus said no, right? Now, why did he say no? He didn't say no because he didn't want the daughter delivered. He didn't say no because it wasn't God's will to deliver her. Is that right? He said no because he was obeying the command to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first, yes. right? So that's why. So his answer, especially now, because you remember when he first sent out his disciples, he said, don't go into the way of the Samaritans, don't go to the way of the Gentiles, remember that? He said, but just go into the houses of Israel, go throughout Israel, isn't that right? He said, at first it has to go to them. Then later he said, now take this to the whole world, right? So we can see there was a time period in which he was working that he had to focus on the Jew first and then to the Gentile, right? So this was not a part of his nature or his character in telling this woman no. It was necessary because of a promise that was made to Abraham. Can we agree with that? Yes. So <clears throat> now notice beyond that, even though, and this is a thing that stood out to me, even though he told her no, he had a reason, but he told her no, she still got it. Her faith overrode his no. Do you get that? Yes. And now understand, today, see, that's the thing. People say, well, you know, sometimes God's answer is yes. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's wait. Or sometimes it's maybe, you know, some, wait later or something, right? <clears throat> okay, all the promises are in him, yes, yes, and in him, amen, which means so be it. So God cannot say no to what he's already said oh, yes to. Do you get that? So when you hear, when you think you hear no from God, you may be hearing no, but it ain't from God, right? And now here's another thing I'll, I'll remind you. In the garden, remember in the garden, when God was talking to Adam, okay, the first voice you hear, God told Adam, don't eat of this. Isn't that right? The next voice you hear talking to Adam, talking to Eve, right, is Satan saying, has God really said? Well, yeah, God said don't. And then the devil comes along and says, did God really say don't? And, right? So the first voice you hear is usually God. 
And the second voice you hear is usually the devil. All right, in that sense. Do you understand that? But now notice this. There is always an Ishmael before an Isaac. Right? So when you're believing for something, many times the enemy will try to back off and give you a certain level of alleviation to get you to settle whenever you are to push on through and get the whole thing. Do you understand? We have seen this over and over again. When I first started ministering to people, especially people with cancer, I started noticing. We would go in, we'd blast this thing. They would be doing, they'd start doing good. Everything looked good. And we're like, yes, okay, we got it. And, and it was strange about it because then I would, the next thing I would hear, they, they were dead. But, but the doctor said they had no cancer. But then the thing came back on them. And I started realizing we didn't kill it. We just knocked it out. And when it came back too, it killed them. That's why many times people say, uh, can you pray for me uh, you know, tonight? And, and honestly, I've been in meetings where, well, we had one meeting in um, Zimbabwe, 120,000 people there. And so there's that's a big crowd. I said, how many of you are sick? And over, they said at least 10,000 hands went up. I'm sure it was many more than that, but at least 10,000 hands went up. So imagine trying to lay hands on every person in those kind of meetings. When I go to Ukraine, we'll have 2,000, 2,500, 3,000 people in one church, right? And then I go to Czech Republic, and it's the same thing again. But if you go in there, now out of that 2,500 people or even let's say 2,000 people, uh, there's at least 1,800 that need healing. And so they're lined up. It usually takes four, five, six hours. And I'm standing there ministering to people consistently for that until every person, we don't leave anybody uh, that didn't have hands laid on them that want to be ministered to. We minister to every person. And so it takes a while to go through. But there have been times uh, that, especially when I first started, that I wasn't, uh, I didn't know how to operate more out of the spirit than let the flesh carry. So after about an hour and a half, you start to get tired. <clears throat> well, I didn't know, and by that time, uh, I had to start realizing what Dr. Summerall had taught us, how to operate out of our spirit. Now when I minister, I'm stronger when I finish than when I started. In the beginning, I didn't get that. I get tired, but it's because I was carrying it in the flesh, and the flesh was doing it, but when I let the Spirit do it, I don't get tired. I let the Spirit energize me, and I get stronger as I go along. So many times people would say, uh, would you pray for me? In the beginning, I would say, well, are you going to be here tomorrow? Yeah, okay, then let's just wait till tomorrow. But then I started finding out that many times the people, especially if it was terminal, what doctors call terminal, terminal is not in God's vocabulary. There's no such thing as terminal in God's vocabulary, right? So <clears throat> whenever somebody would say that, I said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see, you, see you tomorrow. We started noticing many times they died that night. Why? Because the devil knew. And so he did his best to kill them before we got to them, right? And so I started saying, uh, people would say, I, you know, I'd be ministering for four, five, six hours, and then I start to leave, and somebody would say, oh, we got one more person here. This is a terminal case. Have you got time? And, and our, our kind of a, it's not a joke, but it's a saying, always got time for one more. We've always got time for one more. And because I started realizing if I pushed them off and said, don't do it, they would die. And so we don't give the enemy that chance. We, we, get, we, any, any, we never turn a person away for prayer, right, for ministry. And so we started ministering to them because the enemy will try to do that to try to make it. And he'll try to get people, well, I'll go tomorrow. Well, I'll do this later. And we don't even hear about it, but they die that night, right? Never put it off. As soon as you see it, jump on it. I mean, get to it right then. Amen? Yes. So, um, <clears throat> I need to move along here. We'll, we'll keep going this. But the, the whole point there was that we're not called to be judges, but deliverers. And once you know you can help people, it, uh, you don't care how they got that way. Right? Why? Because that's the love of God. The love of God doesn't care how they got that way. Now, understand, we have to realize Mark 16, laying hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That is to be a sign and the goodness of God healing this person, an unsaved person, is supposed to show them God is real and turn them around. The purpose of Mark 16 is to get an unbeliever to become a believer. The purpose of Mark 16 is not to give believers something to play with. Oh, we're going to go out and just lay hands on the sick. We're going to go out and heal the sick. Bring the cameras. Let's go heal the sick. Let's, let's just have, oh, isn't this fun? Oh, you want to do this? And, and no, we have to realize it is for a sign. It's very serious. It's not something to play with. You can enjoy it, but it's not something to play with. There's a person right now that's very well known, and there's videos on YouTube of them ministering to a person on the street, and their friend 
uh, was there, and their friend is a witch, a self-proclaimed witch. And this person was showing this person, oh, here's, here's how you heal the sick. Uh, and then they got the witch to actually pray for the person. And that person got well, but they got a, a witch to do it, a professed witch, right? That is not the purpose of Mark 16. Now, God loves people, and he will heal people, and he'll even use us to do it. You know, why? Because we're all he's got. And so he will use us, even sometimes if we're messed up, he will use us to do it, not because we're special, but because he loves them that much. That's what we have to remember. But it is not a game. This is life or death for people. What you do with this teaching over the next day or so will determine whether people live or die. It's that, that's what I have to live with every day. That's why my phone is never off. It's always by the bed. My wife jokes, and she said, you know, um, <clears throat> I never thought I was marrying a doctor, you know, whenever, but that's how it is because we're on call. We're never off. We're always on call. Now, <clears throat> and I, I tell everybody, honestly, I very seldom... Probably in the last 20 years, I probably had maybe, maybe 30 nights that I wasn't awakened by phone calls <clears throat> because people try to die all hours of the day, right? And, and you know, and usually it's between, uh, usually between 2 and 4 in the morning is when most people try to die, right? And that's not just because it's inconvenient. It's just the way it works when people's systems are usually at their weakest, Right? And so that's when he tries to kill people. So, um, <clears throat> so this is real life. This is not just something to play with. It's not some, oh, we want to set up a healing room, so let's do this and let's play games. With it. No, this is people's lives. So you either have to do it or don't, but you don't play with it because if you don't do it right, people will die. Amen? Amen. So this is serious stuff. This is real life. Uh, I didn't get into this, you know, to be in the healing ministry. I got into this because I wanted truth because I didn't want another grave. And years after, my first daughter died in 1981. Then we had our daughter, our first daughter. Then we had our son. Then we, when my first daughter passed away, we had another daughter. And then after her, we had another daughter. So we total had four children, uh, three daughters, and one son. Of those, the son and the other two daughters are, of course, still living. Now, in 1989, my third daughter okay, uh, fell out of a second-story window and she fell two stories head first onto a concrete patio. And whenever I was sitting inside the door by the patio and I heard something hit, I didn't know what it was. But now you got to remember, this, the difference between this is from 1981 to, now she was born in 82, but from 1981 until 89 when this happened, about when she was born in 82 to 89, she's seven years old. And so during that time, I had spent time with Dr. Sumrall. We had spent time... Uh, talking with Wilfred Wright and his wife Gertrude, John Lake's daughter. We had spent all this time studying. I was obsessed with this. I mean, that's just what I did. Usually anywhere from, you know, 12 to 15, 16, 17 hours a day, I studied this. And I was going through the scriptures, and I was going through Strong's Concordance, and I was listening to cassette tapes and going through these things and studying this stuff out and saying, okay, that's what he said there. That's not true. This is what the Bible says. And I was figuring this stuff out, and it was all coming together. So whenever I heard her hit the ground, my first instinct, you know, was to go. I didn't know what it was, so I went out to see because I heard it on our patio right by me. And so I went out. When I walked out, she was lying face down on the ground. Uh, her hands were where she had tried to stop herself, but the, and they were still there. And so she was face down on the concrete. Uh, I picked her up, turned her over. <clears throat> there was blood in her mouth. Her tooth had gone through her lip. Her nose was smashed flat into her face. Her head was banged up. Um, I forgot to get the flash drive to bring over. I'll bring it uh, after when we come back at 2 after the next break. Uh, I'll, I'll bring it over. I have a picture of her in the hospital where you can see all the damage that was done. Both of her wrists were broken, right? Her leg was crushed. But when I took her up, there was no heartbeat. There was no breath. There was nothing. She was dead. I listened for the heartbeat. You know, everything, there was blood in her mouth, but none of it was coming out. It was just pulled up in her, in her mouth. So I picked her up. And the first daughter, uh, whenever she died, of course, they took her away, and we didn't see her until the funeral. And so, but this one, whenever I picked her up, I started walking around the patio, and the patio was probably about nine foot, uh, probably, yeah, probably about seven by nine or seven by 12 foot patio. Wasn't real big. And so I was just walking back and forth. I hold her in my arms, and immediately, here's the two things. Remember yesterday? I was thinking about this yesterday when I was preaching. 
it said that the devil took Jesus up on the top of a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms in a moment of time. That mean, he, This wasn't a long, drawn-out movie. He saw everything instant at one time. Now, how do you do that? Only spiritual. Because it's not this way, it's this way. right? So he can show you all of that at one time. When my daughter fell out of the window and I picked her up, immediately, the first thing that happened was I saw my first daughter's funeral. The whole thing, which was two days from the time she died until we buried her, two days there. The two days was condensed to a microsecond in, in my mind to where I saw that whole thing, but it was, it was sped up, but it wasn't moving quick. I mean, that which had to be spiritual. So I see all of this, and then I hear this voice. And this voice said, you're, you're, you're losing another one. You're going to bury another one. You're losing another one. You're going to bury another. And it, was, it wasn't, you know, do something. It was like, this is what's going to happen. Almost like a give up because this is what's going to happen. And so I'm walking, and I'm seeing that, and I'm hearing that in my head. But by this time, now this has been seven years since my first daughter died, and we had learned a few things from then. And so instead of, you know, trying to find a phone or doing that kind of stuff, that what I started saying out of my mouth was, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And I just, that's the only statement I ever made over and over and over. I kept saying that same thing. And the thing is, I had to get that voice in my head saying, you're going to lose another one, was loud. So I had to get loud. I had to get my voice louder than the voice in my head to where I heard what I was saying more than I heard what the devil was saying. And so I'm yelling this, walk around the patio. I did this for about 20, 25 minutes, walk around the patio with her in my arms. Her arms are back, her head's back. And all I'm saying is, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And I'm yelling at the top of my lungs by this time. My wife had, uh, had just come home, as a matter of fact. She was upstairs with the other two children. They heard something going on, but they didn't know what was going on. So then after 20, 25 minutes, I go into the house. Nothing's happened. My daughter's still dead. I go into the house. I go over by our kitchen to where there's a wall. I sit her down on the floor. I prop her body up against the wall. Her arms are down. Her head is down. And when somebody dies, their head, see, if I drop my head, it only goes so far because of the muscle tension. When somebody's dead, it drops to about here. It's a total different thing. And so when she dropped her head down like that, blood started draining out of her mouth a little bit. So then I had a yellow pullover type shirt on. And so I got down in front of her and I started pointing my finger at her chest. And I started saying, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. That's the only thing I ever said over and over. About that time, my wife and children heard what's going on. They come running downstairs. Everybody's panicking, screaming, all this stuff because there's blood everywhere and everything's going on. And I remember turning to her and I said, shut up. If you can't believe, leave. And everybody got quiet and everybody got focused. Turned back to Rebecca and I started saying, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And that's all I said. After a 45-minute total time, approximately 45 minutes, all of a sudden, because she was sitting like this, and it was like someone put defibrillators on her because she just jerked spewed blood all over me because it came out of her mouth. She opened her eyes. We got to watch her. It was the strangest thing. I'd never seen it before. But we watched her start to focus. It was like we could see her coming back into her body. And she could. She sat there and she opened her eyes. And the first thing she said was, Daddy, I'm hungry. First thing. So I went into the kitchen, got some pita bread that we had on her on stove. And I, started, I tore off small piece. Now, she couldn't eat it because she had a tooth through her lip and all that. But, and I didn't know this at the time, but I took the bread. I put it in her mouth, and she was trying to chew. And it, it wasn't like a meal. It was, that's what I'm saying. This whole thing was you know, orchestrated by the Spirit of God because she, she was able to swallow it, but that was about it. And so then we picked her up, put her in the car, and then we took her to the hospital. right? And so when we got to the hospital, that's whenever the picture was taken that I'll show you this afternoon. But they hooked her all up with all this stuff, and they put things on her head, and they verified that she had been dead, at what they said, clinically dead. That's what they call people that come back, okay? They said she'd been clinically dead for at least 45 minutes. And so when she came back, now, I didn't know it at the time, but later as I was telling the story, uh, at a DHT, there was a nurse there, and she said, later, she caught me during the break, and she said, I don't know if you know this or not, she said, but it's a thing that if you put something in a person's mouth, food, it starts the entire digestive system. It causes the entire... Now, see, what happens is when a, the spirit, the body without the spirit is dead. So when the spirit comes back in, the spirit's trying to see, will this body function? If it won't, it will leave, and they're gone. 
But if it comes back and it starts to function, then the spirit can stay there, and that's when the dead are raised. So when I didn't know it, but whenever she said she was hungry, I put bread in her mouth. That started her entire digestive system, which allowed her spirit to grab hold of her body and, or her body to grab hold of her spirit and to stay there. And so that's whenever we I started realizing. Now, the funny thing is, to this day, I travel with a loaf of bread in my car. <laughs> okay? Two reasons. One is uh, another situation that happened later on on the side of the road. A, a man was dead and... I was going to go get bread to give to him because this happened there, the whole story. But he, oh, he was a Jehovah Witness also. And God brought him back. So, but uh, now I carry a loaf of bread in my car too because I usually also have some uh, microwave bacon in there. Just <laughs> <laughs> something to eat when you're on the go. Okay. So, um, but I always have it there just in case. All right. Now, thank you, Jesus. We get to eat bacon anyway. Okay. Now, <laughs> so. Does that make any sense to you, though? Yes. You see, see, a lot of the stuff we've seen happen, we didn't know until later when you analyze and you go, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's why this happened. But we're being led, and we didn't even know we were being led. See, most people make a mistake is they won't move until they know they're led, and most of the time you, you won't ever know you're led until afterwards. Why? Because you should be so in tune with the Spirit. I know most of you think you're not, but God wants to be in tune with you. And he can work through you. Why? Because Philippians 2.13 says it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So when you want to lay hands on the sick, that ain't even just you. That's God in you giving you the want to so that you will become obedient and do what he said to do. So even in that, he's working with you. But most people think, well, I'm not that in tune. I don't, I don't know. No, you, you are that in tune, just maybe not in your head. Because your spirit is perfectly in tune with God. Do you get that? Your spirit is perfectly in tune. It's just your head. Usually you know what to do, but your head talks you out of it. Why? Because the first voice you hear is God, and the second voice you hear is usually the devil. That's just the way it works. Do you get that? Now, here's the other thing. Now, I'll give you one more example, and then we'll send you out. Let's say you hear this teaching. Now, here's a thing that's going to happen. When we get done with this seminar... You're going to leave from here. You're going to go back out into the public, and even before then, you're going to be out in the public. One of the things you're going to notice is you'll probably be trying to write me. I get testimonies all the time. People say, I just went to your seminar, and I'm amazed at how many sick people there are. Where did they all come from? <laughs> and the fact is, you didn't, they were there before, but you didn't recognize them. And you say, well, how can they be there before, but I didn't recognize them? Okay. Have you ever thought about buying a new car, and you have it picked out in your mind? And as soon as you decide what car you want to buy, you see it everywhere. Have you ever noticed that? Why? Because now you're alert to the fact. But now, why don't you see the sick before you find out that you can do something about it? Because we have this thing as humans that if we don't think we can do something about something, we push it out of our head and we refuse to acknowledge it. And so we don't see all the sick people. But once you know you can do something about it, now you start seeing the sick people because you have decided, I'm going to help. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go to wherever you go to shop, Walmart, grocery store, Target, wherever it is. I don't, you know, wherever you go. You're going to go in there. You're going to get your cart. You know, we used to call them buggies, but cart, whatever you want to call them. And you're going to start walking. And as you walk through, you know, you just come out of this meeting. You're going to see a sick person. Why? Because you're going to see them everywhere. And you're going to see that sick person. And you're going to remember either my voice, but you're going to remember the word of God. Sometimes it'll have the sound of my voice because I quoted it to you. But many times you'll hear the voice of God. You'll hear the word of God. It'll come up. Believers are going to lay hands on the sick. And you're going to look at that and you're going to say, I'm going to do this. Bless God. I'm, I've, I've been taught. I'm equipped. I'm going to do this. And you start pushing your little cart right over toward that sick person. Now, if it's a distance of 10, 20, 30 feet, here's what's going to happen. See, you just heard the voice of God. But before you get there, you're going to hear the voice of the devil. And he's going to say, what if it don't work? What if you do this and it doesn't work? You're going to bring disrepute on God. You're going to give God a black eye if you do this and it doesn't work. Now, what voice is that? That's the voice of the devil. What's he saying? Has God really said that believers lay hands on the sick and they'll recover? See, that's what the enemy's going to hit you with. The first voice you hear, believers lay hands on the sick and they recover. That's God. The second voice, it ain't going to work. What if it doesn't work? What are you going to do if it doesn't work? You're going to be embarrassed. You're going to lose your reputation. Well, guess what? Dead people don't have reputations. At least they're not worried about it anyway, right? 
So you just go ahead and do it. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have a moment. If you could just pause your life. Here you're pushing over. You've heard the word of God. Now you've had this thought. So you've got two things here. Now, if you could just push, pause, and stop right there. You have a choice. Now, the problem is you can't do that. But you have a choice between these two voices you've heard. Do you push on into obedience? Or do you back off into doubt? And unbelief, because the word doubt means to stop, hesitate, or back off. See, now you cannot doubt in faith. So doubting is sin. Do, do you get that? But now understand, see, here's what, the, here's what you're going to think. You think, now that I've had this thought, what if it don't work? You think, oh, now I've doubted, so it won't work, so I'm not going to even do it. No, see, to doubt is not faith, so it is to sin. Is that right? So if doubting is sin, then before you can sin, you have to be tempted to sin. Is that right? So the thought, what if it don't work, is not the sin of doubt. It's the temptation to doubt. And if you decide, now, now you have two voices, and both are waiting to hear or waiting to see which you're going to obey. And you have to decide, do you obey the voice of God? That's called obedience. Or do you obey the doubt and the voice of the devil, which is doubt and unbelief? It's just that simple. Now, see, one other thing that, that we've seen now, and I've got to send you out, but one other thing is this. The newest, okay, we kill sacred cows all the time, and we've killed a whole bunch of them. And now I don't even have to deal with some of the early sacred cows that were around when we started. But how many of you know that there's new calves born every day? <laughs> right? I mean, there's new calves that we're having to kill, okay, that's born every day. And the newest sacred cow that I know of, I mean, there's, there's actually a couple of them, but one of the newest and the one that directly uh, deals with what we're talking about is this. And it's the ideal, uh, the idea, not ideal, the idea of activation, that you have to be activated. That is, you do not find that in the Bible anywhere where any person was ever activated. What it is, is you must become obedient. And obedience is a decision to do what God said. See, you don't need activation. See, activation is, oh, I want to do it, I want, but I can't until somebody activates me. No, the truth is uh, you're disobedient and you need to become obedient. And obedience is a decision to do the word. So you don't need anybody to lay hands on you to activate you or to get you started. You need to learn the truth, know the truth. And see, once you... What I'm giving you is revelation that took me 40 years to understand. You're getting it in a couple of days. You should start where I am. You shouldn't have to build to that. You understand? You ought to start where I am and go further. So the idea is not for me to activate you. The idea is for you to learn to be obedient and to start doing what you know you should be doing anyway. That's why you're, the reason you're here is because you know you should be doing this. Inside you, you know this is what you're supposed to be doing. So you have to decide whether you're going to be obedient to it or whether you're not. And that has nothing to do with me laying hands on you to give you anything or anything else because if nothing else happened, you still have to become obedient to the Word of God. And the Word of God says believers lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So if nobody tells you anything, nobody you know, lays hands on nothing, if you just read the Bible, you got to do that. Now, if you do it without correct knowledge, you're going to make mistakes and you're probably not going to have the greatest results. But if you do it with the right biblical knowledge, it should work for you. Amen? Amen? But it comes down to being obedient. You don't need to be activated. You just need to become obedient. And that's the way it is in every truth you learn in the Bible. See, if people think they have to be activated, they've always got an excuse. That, it, that excuse is not going to stand when you stand before God and say, nobody activated me. Okay? Let me ask this. Who do you think activated me? Nobody laid hands to activate me. You know what? You know what, how I got started? I buried a daughter. So if you want to say there, that's an activation, that's an activation you don't want. But I will tell you what, I got fed up with being normal. I got fed up with not seeing what the Bible said I should see. And I decided to do what it said to do. And when I became obedient, we started seeing results. Amen? But nobody laid hands on me to give me power or give me this gift or anything else. We just started doing what the Bible said to do. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, we got somebody coming up. What are we doing?
Come on, everybody give Brother Kerr a big hand. Amen.